Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Susan Culver. I'm a 2020 MLA and MARC graduate and a member of um, Penn Women in Design. Uh, before I introduce our amazing speakers, Vanessa Keith and Julie Torres Moskovitz, um, I would like to share some information about the current and past Penn Women in Design group. Uh, this group was restarted in 2016 by alumna Ramona Adlaka and Ramune Bartusqueda as Penn Women in Architecture. Now in its fifth year, the group has raised over $50,000 to support extensive programming, symposium, and is currently working on its second book along with advisor and lead editor, Professor Franca Tribbiano. Uh, and the group has also undertaken a research investigation uncovering a 70 year history of women architecture alumna at Penn. Despite the 16 year gap between today's speakers, Vanessa Keith and Julie Torres Moskovitz, who formed the original Women in Design group along with other classmates in the late 90s and early 2000s, and our current Penn Women in Design group, the ethos and commitment to increasing equity in the design fields remains the same. And Weitzman students and alumna have been committed to this change by supporting mentorship, skill building, sharing data and information, and supporting actionable tasks to improve and inspire the next generation of designers. You'll hear in Vanessa and Julie's presentations today how the activism and leadership that they brought to their women in design organization as students has manifested in a way of practicing, teaching, and contributing to design fields and their communities. I will introduce Vanessa Keith and Julie Torres Moskovitz. Vanessa Keith is a Master of Architecture alumna from 2000. She is a registered architect and the principal of Studio Teca. Um, <clears throat> Studio Teca, an award winning design firm she founded in 2003, based in Dumbo, Brooklyn. Studio Teca approaches design through a multidisciplinary lens that spans the boundaries between architecture, economic, and social development, as well as urban and environmental concerns. Vanessa is especially interested in the issues faced by cities as they adapt to climate change and in envisioning design-oriented technical and engineering solutions to environmental problems. Vanessa is the author of 2100, A Dystopia Utopia, The City After Climate Change, a book on the future of cities in a hotter world with a preface by Sasaki Sasson, published by Terraform as part of the late Michael Sorkin's urban research series. She is also an editor of Kingston Harbor, Development Transects, a book of urban design work published by Columbia University in 2010. She has taught a capstone course in economic and political development at Columbia SIPA as well as interior design, architecture, and urban design studios at Columbia GSAP, Pratt Institute, City College Spitzer School of Architecture, and the University of Pennsylvania. Julie Torres Moskovitz, Master of Architecture alumna from uh, 2000 as well, is a licensed architect and founder of FET Nature Architecture, FNA, based in Brooklyn. FNA Studio is a vital collaborative firm whose process is founded in research and investigation of new ways to inhabit the urban fabric. This method of working is informed by an aptitude for green technologies, collaboration, and commitment to equity, climate adaption, and reimagining architecture for common good and enjoyment. <clears throat> she is the author of The Greenest Home, Super Insulated and Passive House Design, published by Princeton Architectural Press. And she contributed to Women Rebuild, Stories, Polemics, and future, Futures. Her studio, FNA, completed several resiliency projects in Carnarsie, Brooklyn, as part of NYC's Build It Back program. She is on the advisory board of the Street Vendor Project and the Institute for Public Architecture. And she was appointed by the mayor to the NYC Loft Law Board, which she works, where she works with tenants and landlords. Torres Moskovitz teaches an eco-urban seminar at Syracuse University School of Architecture, and she is a judicial delegate and county committee member for Assembly District 50 in Brooklyn. Before um, our 
presenters uh, give their presentation, I would just like to ask that everyone uh, can introduce themselves in the chat, but we would love if people ask their questions in the Q&A. You can see those are two different uh, buttons. That'll help us keep track of questions and you can um, introduce where you're from and uh, the year you graduated in the chat so we get to know you. And without further ado, thank you so much, Vanessa. Um, you can start your presentation. Thank you very much, Susan. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, um, oops, sorry about that. I think, am I on full screen? Can you see that okay? All right, thumbs up, okay. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about my practice and I'm gonna talk a little bit about just sort of life in general and um, you know how to, how to bring the things that you're interested in and the things that you love into your practice. And one of the things that I love about architecture is you can literally bring anything that you're obsessed with, fascinated by, interested in, into your work. And I've really tried to do that with my life. What you're seeing now is an image from the book 2100, A Dystopian Utopia, The City After Climate Change. And this is actually a street in Moscow where we envisioned um, you know, adding additional density to the city. Um, and this is a parametric, um, you know, proposal for this part of the city. So I will get into that a little bit later, but let me just go forge on onward. So we're currently obsessed with the environment, climate change, and the role that architecture can play in solving this crisis. And you can see here, I mean, I, again, this, the book emerged just out of a fascination that I had for research. Um, the summer is typically a time where it's a little bit slower. And so we would do, we just started doing things that we were interested in in the summer. We would do research projects and we would invite people to come and have a jury with us because it was fun. And so that turned into um, inviting Michael Sorkin, who I, um, you know, was, he was my mentor, my publisher. Um, my champion. He was like such a, an amazing um, person to so many um, younger architects. He really helped out um, tremendously and he created through Terraform this really amazing cohort of people who are really committed to the role that architecture can play in making a difference. And so from there, um, Michael in, invited me to uh, do a competition. Um, and if I had won that competition, I would have gotten a book. Well, I didn't win the competition, um, but I got something better, which was him saying, why don't you be a part of my book series that I'm just starting? So we are, you are three, 2100, a dystopian utopia. And this has turned into, um, you know, just so many amazing things um, for me that, you know, I could never have even imagined. So um, this is a talk that I gave in 2017 at Carnegie Mellon, um, which was, you know, my first big lecture in this big red lecture hall, which was just really amazing. This middle image is, you know, my team um, in Dumbo. Um, over here, you can see a talk that I just gave um, for uh, at the Matadero in Madrid. It was called 12 Cautionary Urban Tales. Um, and it was a part of a larger exhibition on reimagining responses to climate change, which you can see here as well. Um, down here, this is a talk that I gave at um, iBeam. Um, these are some of the uh, people who invited me to give a talk on uh, you know, women in architecture, like a leadership breakfast that was um, put forth by the AIA. So it's about figuring out how things come together. Can we find ways of making cities work more like natural organisms? And this is something that I've been obsessed with for a long time and think it's really important to realize that you might not, you, you know, you're gonna have so many opportunities to bring things into your projects and it might not be that, um, that you get it in every single one, but you know, if you keep plugging away at something, um, you know, you're gonna get there. So, um, here you can see, I'll just sort of um, move around. This is you know, our proposal for New York. And we actually worked on real sites um, that we really, really heavily studied. Um, I was not a, a climate scientist or an expert by any means. I was just very concerned as somebody who comes from an island in the Caribbean, knows the situation in Jamaica and 
realizing that, um, you know, if the situation gets worse, we could be stateless, that um, hurricanes come that are already so much bigger than the country and we don't have anywhere to go. We can't migrate north. Um, there's, there's nothing for us to do. And there are a great number of Jamaicans who have never left Jamaica, have, do not have a passport, do not have any other options, cannot go anywhere. So that is my passion is to really solve this problem. And one of the things I've been thinking a lot when I've been doing this work is what do we do about developing countries? What do we do? You know, how are we going to um, densify? You know, the, there's so much more that I could go into um, about this. There's actually a lecture that I gave, the Carnegie Mellon Lecture is available on Vimeo if you want to see more of this stuff. But I'm just going to touch on it briefly here. So this is our site in New York, which is on the Gowanus Canal. And we proposed, you know, again, using every square inch of the built environment for energy generation, which is here, um, this park, you know, carbon sequestration, and then also having soft edges and things like storm surge barriers to, you know, prevent uh, flooding in different areas. This is our proposal for Johannesburg. And so in Johannesburg, we started looking at, could we move the section uh, in order to create, if we're creating added density, could we create something that allows human beings and animals to coexist? So here you can see an elevated megastructure in Johannesburg and the facade actually contains a habitat for weaver birds, which you can see here. Um, over here on the right is Sao Paulo, Brazil. And this is, you know, in the middle band of the world where at four degrees of warming, it's going to be um, prone to flooding and not really great for large scale settlements. But we have an elevated settlement here that is going to tend to the rainforest and do, um, you know, all sorts of uh, good works. Um, over here, you can see Moscow in the lower left-hand corner. This is another view of that first view that you saw where we're trying to figure out, can we, you know, weave through the city? Can we build on top of the city? Can we, you know, how can we add density? If, if we have to, uh, you know, downscale the, you know, population density in the middle band of the world, you know, if, if it does come to that, and I hope it doesn't, um, what are we going to do with our existing cities that are out of the danger zone? How can we make more space for everyone? And also, how can we make equitable space? How can we make space where we don't have, um, you know, extreme disparities of wealth and we all share in uh, the Earth's resources um, in a fair and sane way? This in the middle is Phoenix, and Phoenix is obviously not a terribly sustainable place, but this is an outpost settlement that is focused on generating green energy. So you can see here, um, farming, uh, urban farming. These devices which are on these um, homes are actually wind belts. This is also wind. Um, these things on the roof are actually, um, you know, algae, uh, you know, generating energy and uh, through algae. And over here on the right is Troll Antarctica. So this is currently a research station that I think varies between four and 34 people. Um, and what we proposed for here was a large scale um, buildings that are not skyscrapers because as we were studying the site we realized that if you have a tall tower you're going to cast a huge shadow so these things generate wind and we we optimize for the solar performance okay so we're interested in the intersection of architecture and technology how can we take these new tools and use them differently so um we're really interested in VR. We're actually, the next phase of what we're doing for 2100, a dystopian utopia, is to put it into VR. We're working with a couple of um, VR AR artists right now and putting together a pitch for this. So here you can see an animation moving through our, um, you know, one of our New York settlements, which you just saw um, before. Um, and here's somebody in the office in VR um, moving, navigating through this. This is us with the Glimpse group. Um, going through uh, VR, I think they they um, you know were really great in sharing their resources with us. Um, and then you know again, I gave I was part of the framework follow and future of women in design at Penn, which was a really great um, event that um, I had the pleasure of participating in. Um, here you can also see again this is a site visit in Costa Rica. You know we um, have done design work for a sustainable uh, community there. Um, we do um, investment packages where we figure out, like, how can we, we do market research? How can we make this thing work? Um, you know, there's my horse. I actually, the horse fell with me on him. That was a whole other story. Um, Landscape Architecture Magazine, um, you know, wrote a really great article about the book called Thrive or Survive, which you can find. Um, and, you know, we do a combination of things. So we do 
you know, I, the teaching, the book, the work, the, you know, it's sort of everything. And I don't know what it's like to have a J-O-B job because my job is what I love. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know, I could go on forever about this, but I have limited time. So in trying to imagine the best possible trajectory for humanity, we hope to inspire those who feel powerless in the face of climate change. And I've mentioned my work in developing countries before I came to, uh, to Penn. I went to um, SIPA, which is the School of International and Public Affairs. I studied economic and, uh, economic and political development there. So I really think about that a lot. Um, you know, when we uh, do proposals for projects, certainly um, some of the work that we've done um, in other countries um, in terms of like some of the master planning stuff that we've worked on. Um, and again, one of the things that I want to say is like, don't say no to anything. Do, do everything because each little thing that you do will have something in it that will help you get to the next level. So this is actually like a talk that I gave uh, to 15 people at La Casita Verde, which is an awesome um, you know, it's a, it's a community garden in Williamsburg. And, you know, these people were really fantastic and they invited me to something else. This is me with my students at City College and we went to the Skyscraper Museum. This is me taking a picture of them. These are two of my members of my team. We worked on this project here, which was a, an, a, an office annex and an office for a plastic surgeon. Um, these are some micro apartments that we did in the East Village. So we approach design through a multidisciplinary lens that integrates architecture, economic development, and environmental concerns. And I mentioned some of the work in Jamaica, which you can see here. We've done um, proposals and presentations to the prime minister where we talk about climate change, where we talk about what to do with shorelines and all of that. So you can see some of that work here. Um, but we also do, you know, architecture and interiors. This project here was a lot of fun. You can see us on site having a meeting with um, the design team. Uh, here's some work on the custom millwork. These are, you know, my team in the office and around the office in Dumbo. So living more in harmony with the planet means embracing ecological strategies and approaches that are more a loop than a line. I talk about this a lot. It's really important to not have um, massive excavation of raw materials at one end and a giant heap of trash at the end. We really need to change the way that we live on this planet that is such an important mission to me and it should be important to everybody. Um, Drawdown Learn was a really fantastic event that I was invited to participate in. This book you should definitely get. I mean, get my book, but get this book too. We're really on the same wavelength. These are a hundred um, techniques to uh, draw down the, the climate. And I, we used all of those techniques, but we just combined them into 14 case studies. So. Here's my talk there. I also gave a talk at Urban Green, Cities in the Future of Negative Emissions. The people on this panel were amazing. They're all actively trying to um, you know, absorb CO2 from the air, from the sea. Like, how do we do this? There's a lot of really creative thought on this right now. And I gave a talk at the AIS uh, Northeast Quad Conference in 2018, which was really fantastic. Um, it was really great to see um, you know, some of the cohort and some of my students um, from City College there. So we believe that space conditions are interactions with one another and that architects can change the world. Um, I really, really believe that. Um, here you can see, again, just some of the work that we do. This is Aladdin. So these are some of the lighting tests that we were doing for this uh, hookah lounge, which we redid. And here, actually, my partner sent me a couple of pictures. And at first, I thought that the place had caught fire, but it was actually um, a winning soccer match that everybody was really excited about. So it's really fantastic to do work that becomes a part of the community that way. Um, this place is in Queens, and uh, we even designed the logo. Here you have Little Bird um, H HR, which is an African-American-owned um, firm that does human resources for schools and they are on Inc. Uh, Magazine's five, top 5,000 fastest growing companies. So it was really an honor to do this design work for them. Um, and this is Flatiron Marketing Offices, which is a project that we really love. It's an early project, but um, I think it really showcases the ability um, that we've developed and how you can do great design with great lighting and color and be really imaginative and scrappy. We didn't have money for the lighting. So these lights, we actually made custom out of ducts. Um, there are all sorts of creative solutions um, for things if you, uh, if you put your mind to it. So as a firm, we are, in gen we are energized by the prospect of being a part of solving one of the most pressing challenges on, to human life on Earth. Um, as I mentioned, I didn't have a, 
budget. I didn't have a PR. I didn't have any of that. I just never said no to a single talk. And I just would go to a talk and I would meet somebody else and they would say, wow, you're so passionate about this. Will you talk? And I would say yes. And so here is, I gave a talk at ADO and it was on sustainable travel, sustainable tourism coming from the Caribbean. This is something I'm deeply interested in. Peter Collins, who's amazing, invited me to his podcast. And then he also did a uh, television interview with me. Um, he's based in California. He gave a copy of my book to Representative Jared Huffman and he held it up on his TV thing, which I was just, you know, bowled over by. Um, I gave a couple of lectures. Uh, I was invited by um, the head of the HBCU Green Fund to give these two Earth Day lectures um, at Clark Atlanta University and at Georgia Tech. Um, this is my uh, Peter Collins TV thing. And then these are, this is me with some of the students at Georgia Tech. These are some of the people from ADO. Um, we are very interested in how human beings function as a system and the economics of it and how to implement positive change. And again, this is a picture from the climate strike. These are some of the women that I work with. I'm on the board of the Women's Studio Workshop. Um, I love this book because it's, uh, it's one of, by one of the founders and it's, how do you know that your uh, leader is a dictator? And this one says, my wife loved shoes. I needed all those stolen billions to buy her more. So, you know, sometimes a little humor helps you get through this. Um, it's also really wonderful to be, um, you know, a board member, uh, you know, with an organization that has such a great mission. Um, here on the top left, you can see, um, you know, design work that we've done for a building in Brooklyn. This is a pastry cafe and this is the construction site. This is us in the office with Michael and one of those great reviews that we did in summers. That's Michael and me. Um, this is me at UR with the proof of my book, which I was so proud. And this is some work that we're doing in the Dominican Republic. Um, and again, I mentioned those investment packages, um, you know, and design speculation and also research is definitely a strong part of what we do, including economic and market research. So climate change is our most pressing concern. All the other stuff that we care about won't matter if we don't fix this, so let's. Um, this is my talk at a People's uh, Climate Action Plan for New York, which you can see here, and also a talk that I gave at NYU. Architecture is this all-encompassing and huge undertaking. It changes you the way you think and the way you see the world. I could not agree with that more. When I was in my first studio in architecture, I would wake up uh, dreaming my projects um, and I never got lost in a building again after that. So here you can see some of my students um, at City College. Here you see my students um, this semester at Penn. Um, here is a UR event um, and you can say, see, I don't know if you can read this, but this is one of their slogans, which is engaging and tireless propaganda for the good, the just and the fair. And I feel really honored to have been a part of that and to continue to be a part of that mission. This is me with some of my team. And this is actually um, a, a penthouse apartment that we are working on in Sutton Place. So um, to conclude, we can look at how we construct cities and try to live in balance with the rest of the planet. If we can solve that, we've nailed it. And I really, really believe all of the things that we need are out there. All of the technologies and techniques, everything that we put in the book is something that somebody somewhere is researching and doing. And that really is my mission to connect the dots on that and to do everything that I can to, you know, to push us in a good direction. Um, and so, so far, so good. Um, and I'm gonna keep pushing. So this is a restaurant that we did. Again, more of us in the office. This is us in Dumbo. And you know, please support Terraform and please support independent press. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vanessa. That was super excellent. Um, before Julie gives her presentation, I just wanna mention when you're talking in the chat, please, um, when you're sending it out, send it out to all panelists and attendees not just panelists, because then no one else can see it. Um, and please, uh, another reminder to uh, ask your questions in the Q&A. Uh, Julie? Hello, Susan, thank you for introducing me. Can you see the screen? I just yep. want to make sure. Okay. And it's great to follow Vanessa, who was in my class of 2000 and is a good friend of mine. And we often, I think one of our pieces of advice would be like, it's good to have a cohort and um, other architects you can lean on to discuss how to run a small practice. Um, over the years, we've helped each other a lot. 
So I wanted to start here with some ephemera. I like that word. Um, but this is back to 1999, our Women in Design series. And I noticed in the chat that we have um, other classmates on. So I just think it's interesting to share with you. <laughs> Interesting to share with you. This is when we were students. We wanted to make sure we had uh, Speakers that we wanted to see we wanted to hear from women architects and um, diverse architects um, And that wasn't necessarily the Lecture series at that time. I think also following Vanessa. I can share that my education previous to architecture was French and African studies which was focused on colonialism and neo-colonialism um, in Africa. So I think our, her background in um, economics and political development and my background um, help explain a little of what we came into when we went to graduate school. So here we were, we were inviting Lizanne Couture, Homo Farjadi, Ming Fong, Dagmar Richter, and Liquid Inc. And we also had plans, it never happened, but we had plans for Zaha Hadid was gonna lecture. Um, and on the next slide shows you, we paired this with uh, Architectural Explorations, which was an open call to Philadelphia and to women architects that were working in the city at the time. So we had an exhibit of their work as well as working with the Architectural Archives to highlight work by Susan Maxman, Adele Santos, Denise Scott Brown, and Ann Ting. And then the final ephemera slide was, uh, I also separately worked on a series that was um, Martin Luther King Day, uh, to the year 2000, a forum to explore the relationship between community art and architecture, which came out of a design build week, uh, four of us, four students spent in Detroit during, I think it was during a spring break. And then we came back and we did this uh, symposium on MLK Day, which included Kyung Park, who was working at the International Center for Urban Ecology in Detroit, Rick Lowe with Project Row House in Houston, Texas, and Lily Ye, who's been part for years of the Village of Art and Humanities in Philadelphia. Um, okay. So just a little background, um, bringing us back to the year 2000. And here are slides of my practice. So I have an architecture firm of five people. And this first image is an example of some of our activism where we mix, um, I mean, I think it's seamless, the relationship between architecture and politics and um, the fight for social justice and equity. So this was a bill this summer when de Blasio and New York City Council was proposing intro 1947 that was going to, um, it was to open the streets for restaurants and street vendors. We were advocating and I spoke on the public hearing. We did these quick renderings to show how even in my community in Williamsburg, we could share the uh, street between street vendors and down the street there is a Shake Shack that has their restaurant set up. So we wanted to quickly advocate for street vendors um, because they're often marginalized in the city. And we also thought it was an opportunity on the right. You see hand sanitation, um, recycling station, sitting areas, just fun for the streets, more like a safe block party during that pandemic. Um, here, similarly, um, and as Susan mentioned in the intro, I'm on the Street Vendor Project Advisory Board, and there's a lot of work, a lot of advocacy we have to do. There's a bill we've been trying to pass called Intro 1116. Um, women, in particular, there was a study of women vendors have um, faced a lot of harassment on all levels, including not being in the market um, to be in line for getting proper permits. They, they have a license to handle food, but there's no permits in the city unless you're part of the underground market that costs 15 to $25,000 to have a permit. Um, that's because the city hasn't issued any since 1983. 
Um, so we're pushing for the lift the caps bill. And this image section is from Jackson Heights, Queens, where we were imagining with um, New York Senator Jessica Ramos and Street Vendor Project, uh, a community of street vendors, women that would occupy five spaces you can see on the right within the, um, this transit hub. And they would safely be able to sell um, food and merchandise um, in these spaces. So we, we worked with them as a team and we were also working with, so it was state and city council members and vendors, um, street vendor projects comprised of 2000 street vendor members. Next is, um, I kind of have these different, in our practice, I have these different pillars of um, work that is important to us. Um, that was social equity. I just showed you this is sustainability and passive house. So in 2012, I, my office completed the first certified passive house project, which is the picture on the left. And it won an international Passive House Award in 2014 and an AIA coat uh, honorable mention in 2015. This was done at the same time. I had a lot of pressure on me. I was writing a book called The Greenest Home, which is on the upper right uh, by Princeton Press, and that's 18 case studies. Um, big kudos to Vanessa for <laughs> making up and visualizing 18 case studies for 2100. I know from this book it was a lot of work just to have 18 case studies of real projects that um, I had to interview contractors, homeowners, architects. And so I really became involved in Passive House, which if you don't know, probably many of you do know, but uh, the diagram on the right explains that Passive House, it, in general, to sum it up quickly, it's continuous insulation, triple glazed windows and doors, using an uh, ERV, fresh air ventilation system. It can reduce your heating energy by 90% and your overall energy by 75%. And then obviously if you start adding um, renewables on site, then you can get yourself to net zero. This building here on the left, we have rainwater collection that you see on the right and on the roof is solar, photovoltaic and thermal. We worked on this project, I learned a lot and this really shaped the whole direction of our firm because most of our work is passive house work, retrofit and new. So there's a thermal image below where you see that what we call the tight house um, in Park Slope, Brooklyn, the blue one where we've insulated it and used triple glazed window. It's not leaking fossil fuels from the inside out during the heating season. We eliminated gas. So most of my clients are eliminating gas coming into their homes altogether. We also work to study um, and monitor the home to understand the post occupancy and how it was functioning and then share that information with other architects. Through the book publication, as Vanessa mentioned, I was able to lecture often and be on panel discussions where I could share information about um, the tight house and the projects in the book. This is a example, someone saw my um, book or ordered my book and then retained us. Um, they're from East Atlanta. They wanted to do a passive house that also had a film component to it. They wanted to have a film club that met in the living room, that upper level space, because they love um, films and then cooking for friends. So that was kind of a combined. We like to combine good design and passive house, like it all works together. Um, Here's an example of some of the advocacy work we do. An artist friend of ours was doing a menopause pop-up in downtown Brooklyn and asked if we could help visualize what the exhibition space would look like. Um, so this was only for three weeks, um, but we took part in it and helped create the, the look of the space. Here's from Syracuse University, I often teach studio, but also I've, I've, this is my fourth time teaching urban, eco-urban seminar, a class I um, designed. And I also teach um, environmental technology. This is giving students, I feel like, the basis for how to practice and understand bigger issues 
aside from the immediate project in front of you. So for example, on the top, um, that's the Newtown Creek um, treatment plant, in, which is in Greenpoint near me. We take the students there and there's, um, that's where we process all of our wastewater. There was also a food waste program where turning energy into biofuel that's out, run out of that facility. On the right is in the Bronx where we were doing uh, learning about air tightness and um, uh, passive house uh, hands-on demonstration. On the left in the far Rockaways, working on resiliency with the landscape um, workshop. <laughs> we built resiliency designs and then saw if high tide, who would win, like which project would be taken out, or actually which project would last the longest, but this was part of our urban resiliency section, which includes workshops with places like Arab Engineers and WXY. On the right is from a facility, sure we can, of canners in Bushwick, Brooklyn, who um, like 700 families live from collecting cans for distribution. And we pair that with going to Sims Recycle Center in Brooklyn. This is, um, I do a lot of work with um, the FLIR camera and thermal imagery, studying it in different ways with the students as they get to know New York City. And here's uh, Broadway where we, it's interesting, this thermal image shows that um, the sidewalks were, are heated. We had no idea, but the thermal image shows it. Um, sadly, Broadway's shut down for a while until we figure out the pandemic, but um, here's, I'll just quickly show a couple more projects. This is in Albany, an environmental agency that came to us for net zero passive house. They wanted to walk the talk. This was a collaboration with a Belgian firm, A2M, and Lori Kerr, a policy, um, policy person in New York City. Um, okay, here is for the street vendor project. It's, um, you're looking at a, a roof garden that's part of a training center and below is a commissary. You can see on the top left, um, the commissary is where you, according to the city, you must house your carts to be able to wash them and have a clean kitchen. So we envisioned a social justice commissary with the street vendor project. Here's a project of the foundation during construction because we've built a lot of projects too. I showed a lot of renderings, but over the last 20 years, um, we've built a lot of projects as well that are on our website. I just happen to want to feature the, the ones that are rendered and visualized. But um, here was for Build It Back after Hurricane Sandy. We worked with a cohort team of, we were working on 10 projects. We were responsible for these two in Canarsie, Brooklyn, which is the very end of the L line. And here's the foundation under construction. You can see the two homes on the right. And then on the left, um, the top is one that we elevated and kept existing. And the one on the bottom left is a new home that, because the home was so badly damaged. Um, an, uh, another area of advocacy and interest um, a lot of times I pair this with fellowships. Um, for example, we have a Taconic Fellowship with the Pratt Center that's looking at greening street carts. This was from the um, IPA um, where we were, it was a live work for the workforce exploration. And I, myself, you can see the, the office behind me. We, I live in a live work situation. I guess most of us are during the pandemic, but that's um, how I've been able to run a firm and have an office. So here's showing different ways that people creatively work together in these loft buildings in New York. And we looked at micro power grids for the roofs because they're usually large industrial buildings that have people living in them. So they have ample opportunity for solar. And um, so that led me to be on, on the New York City loft board. And here, um, is a project we did this summer. We've been collaborating for a couple of years with a developer, Sedina Fall, who's from Senegal, that believes in impact investment and quadruple bottom line. This project's called the Mabulo um, Center for Fair Trade. And um, we visualized it for a competition called the UN uh, World Tourism Organization. 
sponsored composition that wanted to include sustainability UN goals, along with looking at redefining tourism um, post or during COVID. And finally, uh, to wrap it up, I wanted to encourage people to, this is my server for our office. Activism is the first folder. <laughs> And I put, I have like tons of stuff in there. <laughs> um, it, if you make a folder, you're more apt to do it. <laughs> but I'm constantly downloading and, and figuring out um, different protests and um, ac actions to do, whether it's postcard writing, advocacy work. Um, so, and on the, on the bottom right is us, um, August 13th, we were in Times Square with Street Vendor Project. And um, I'm next to my staff member, Karina, in that photo, and Kile, who's a friend of mine from the um, advisory board. So I just um, encourage, like, it's, it's very much in our practice that everything flows together, the activism, the teaching, the research, and the architecture. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have a few questions, and I'll just start off by uh, asking a question, and if you have more, um, please put them in the q and A. I just want to start off with the big question of this year. Um, this year, during this intense and charged political and social climate, um, it missed the worst pandemic we've seen in our generations um, that has completely changed the way design firms work. Many firms have found themselves asking how they could be more equitable in not only their firm culture, in hiring, but in their work in communities. But from conversations we've had, um, you know, preparing for this and in your presentations, uh, these conversations are definitely not new to both of you. And um, what aspects of your practices prepared you and allowed you to continue to lead during these uncertain times? And then follow up with that of um, what have these times revealed to you about the state of architecture and design and our situated roles in communities? Well, I really wish that I could talk to Michael Sorkin about this because I think he'd have some really interesting um, observations about this time, but unfortunately he died from COVID early on in this. So that was really, really devastating for you know a lot of us in the whole community. Um, it has made me more energized and more determined to, um, you know, I, I, again, like the, with Black Lives Matter and all of the protests, I, um, I feel like we are in a watershed moment where suddenly other people care about this besides just the people who are impacted by it. And that's been incredibly emotional, overwhelming, heartening, wonderful, terrible, all at once. Um, I really feel like we're in a moment of profound change. And, you know, I we're not going to solve climate, which is, you know, which is a huge part of my mission if we don't make a major change. Um, the planet will still be here, you know, we won't. Um, so, you know, I think that sometimes you need to shake things up and this isn't working. So what are we going to do now? This isn't working for the vast majority of people. It's not working for the planet. So we have a chance now to re-envision the new. So in terms of like firms and, you know, what people can do to, you know, to be more diverse, I mean, um, you know, my goodness, there are so many amazing budding young architects of color out there. I know because I've taught them for like 14 years at City College. They're amazing. Um, they go on from their five-year BARC to do incredible things all over the place. Um, you know, many of my students have gone on to Harvard, have gone on to all sorts of Ivy League schools. So, you know, you just have to, you know, look for them and find them and, you know, nurture them and mentor them if you can. Um, you know, I think that five-year programs of architecture, you know, BRCs are an entry point for um, students of color and first-generation um, college students and immigrants to get entry into this profession. And so I think that supporting those programs is important. Having those programs is important. Outreach into the community, working with, um, you know, with, with high school kids, right? You know, getting them interested in design. And then also, you know, doing some of the work that Julie does, like, you know, with the community and that I've done in Jamaica, where, you know, I've worked with uh, you know, squatter settlements in different countries. I've worked with, you know, what do we, how do we manage these problems? I think that the architect in a lot of sort of developing country type of settings is 
the person people go to and it should be here too. Like the architect is, everyone knows what an architect is. And, you know, I want to be, I want to be able to do projects that touch the whole realm of humanity from like the, the highest to the lowest to the variety of whatever. And I think that, that we really need to do that more, um, reach out more, do more. Um, you know, that's all I can say about that. I could probably go on forever, but I'm probably talking too much. And, and I'll just add to that, if that's right, Susan. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would say, I mean, my class, the Eco Urban Seminar, the way I started out is by reading Whitney Young Jr.'s um, AIA convention speech, 1968 in Portland, where he called architects irrelevant. And I really feel that we are borderline irrelevant <laughs> unless we do something to be relevant, right? So, which to me is getting in the street and understanding um, what people need, what public space needs, uh, how we can bring social justice and equity. So um, that I, I give advice to my students, like don't wait for you to have a boss that gives you an assignment. There's so many um, people and groups that have um, concerns. It could be a, a farmer's market that's not well trafficked. How do you help them build up their um, traffic so that they can survive and that vendors are making money and staying there? There's all kinds of skills we have. I'm not suggesting someone without a license like build a building, but <laughs> there's all types of people in our community and we are the community, we are the neighborhood. We have to get engaged and involved to be able to help and there's plenty to help. I've noticed over the years in practice, a lot of architects can't speak for everyone, but in New York City um, will do renderings pro bono, or I guess it's not called pro bono, for free for a developer. And, but then they, they don't do it for a community. So I just made it and I decided not to enter competitions that are just going to be 2000 great entries and go nowhere. But when I have um, a chunk of money in my office to spend, I'm going to spend it with my staff working on a to solve a problem that I care about that we care about in our own community um, for street vendors or um, I, I decided with um, Sedina in Senegal, that was something I was very interested in. I have a background in um, African studies and French, and I wanted to see, I believed in his impact investment. So just choosing carefully where you spend that time, I made a conscious decision to not spend it on a fly-by-night developer coming through that's just going to use my designs and leave me, but I'm going to invest in community with my power <laughs> as an architect. Excellent. Um, I'm going to, there's two questions in the Q and A, um, and I'm just going to read both of them. One's to Julie, one to Vanessa and um, um, from California. Um, she says, Julie, thanks for your work. Uh, I like how your work also includes real advocacy for policy change in addition to your bill projects. We've been involved with the city agencies to do community projects in the Bay Area. I'd be curious to know about uh, what pathways have gotten you involved in urban policy and advocacy in New York. Maybe we can compare with California. And then for Vanessa, um, you mentioned VR. How, how are you using it in your practice? Could you expand on how you're using it and how you envision it may aid in more design? Um, those two questions. Okay, I mean, is it all right if I'll go first because you mentioned the question first. Um, thank you for asking from California. Yeah, I got into activism on Passive House and policy and realizing attending Passive House conferences, but also after I wrote the book and lecturing and speaking to people that, uh, okay, I can do, you know, one brownstone at a time or if I work on policy, we can change like all the buildings in New York City. So I started, I spent a couple years partnering with A2M and um, a Belgian firm that had done large scale passive house in Europe. And we did a lot of advocacy work just um, on our own meeting with um, 
all kinds of government agencies and just describing the larger scale schools, um, affordable housing, uh, public projects that can all happen the way um, Belgium was able to do. Um, and you can go to Belgium and see all these buildings, they're retrofit, they're landmark, they're new buildings. So that was really empowering to me and I, I realized through that process. Um, and I've also been engaged, I should have mentioned AIA Center for Architecture, teaching trainings on local law. So local law 31 was public buildings have to be 50% better than energy code. And um, so I taught that class with the Belgian and now I'm training to teach a class local law 97, which is New York City buildings over 25,000 square feet are gonna have to become um, energy efficient, like pushing them to, otherwise they're facing carbon penalties in a couple of years. Buildings will also have grades on it, like restaurants. So these are all things from not just me and the Belgian architect going around, but from many, many architects and others concerned about the environment, standing up and meeting politicians and working to make ch policy change. Okay, so I guess I should answer the VR question. Um, I'm really interested in virtual space and in technology, but also in subverting technology. And I don't want VR to just be this uh, expensive gadgets for rich weirdos, which <laughs> sometimes it is. Um, I met Tamiko Thiel, who is a really amazing um, VR AR artist at one of my talks. I gave a talk at iBeam and actually this is kind of how it has gone for me. I go to a talk, I meet somebody, somebody wants to collaborate or wants to do something and it, you know, very, it's happened for me very organically. So Tamiko and I have been trying to find a way to work together and uh, you know, she is as passionate about um, climate change as I am and you know she's done even some of her pieces relate to this and so she brought in um, Olivia McGilchrist who's somebody else she works with who's doing a PhD in um, Canada and we're working with another uh, you know friend of mine who has a space in um, Jersey City that's like a giant um, you know VR AR space um, what we would really like to do, we're trying to put the cities of the book into VR and have a sort of choice matrix. So you can see what choices you make. And if a, you know, a million people make the same choice as you, what is the carbon uh, result of that? And what, what future does that propel you into? So we want, really want to create something where you can see the impacts of your choices, good or bad. Um, it's also not only about individualism, because I think one of the things that's one or individual action. One of the things that's really interesting is that even during the height of the pandemic, the um, emissions didn't go down that much. I think it went down by like maybe 5% and I was in shock, but that's not surprising given that all of the buildings were still on with the electrical running and all this stuff and the AC running 24 seven and all of that kind of stuff, all of that machine, our industrial machine was still going. So um, I think it's, you know, it's important to think about systems, to think about um, policy and advocacy. Um, you know, I didn't mention a lot of the things that I've done in Jamaica. Actually, my family has for the past 20 years, we have a house. Actually, Julie came and stayed with us. Um, it's called Carliva Bay. So if you look up carlivabay.com, you can see some of the stuff that we've done with local groups. We've worked with local schools. We've worked with the Women um, Women's uh, Center of Jamaica. We've worked with um, the Rural Agricultural Development Authority and seeing how we can do things and use these skills to help people um, and to bring, uh, you, you know, again, it's, it's tremendously um, satisfying work. It's tremendously important, I think, to use your skills and your ideas and like, you know, speak to government officials and speak to the local people and reach out and do all of that. And I guess the one thing that I would say is, you know, things can happen very organically if you're really passionate about it, if you're really dedicated to it and you really want to do this. And this is like, I would be doing this anyway. Um, you know, I'm not, I, I like haven't made like any money from my book, you know, this is not, it's really about like, I just want to get the word out. I just want to solve this problem. So if any of you are interested in doing that, email me, <laughs> let's do stuff. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I want to, we're running tight on time right now, but I just want to give you both a um, final comment or anything you'd like to say to the alumni or alumni. Um, and then we'll pass it back to Charlotte. Um, I guess in closing, I, I just really appreciate the Penn 
um, or the Weitzman School called us called us back. Uh, it's exciting to see that there's some that there's continuation. I guess it's been the last two years because I I did I forgot to mention I did write a piece for Rebuild uh, Women Rebuild, and so I met Susan. I met you last year, so I it's great to be, feel connected with activists. Um, current students and I really appreciate the dialogue to bring us all together and it's actually interesting I, I don't know how you feel Vanessa but just to see that I can't even believe it's been 20 years but that we are still activists like we were back then it doesn't go away it's like intrinsic in how we practice and nobody's gonna take that away from us so for anyone listening that is an activist or that wants to make their practice more relevant to these social um, justice, um, economic justice issues. I think that, um, you know, you have the power to do it as an architect and I happily talk to anyone who wants any advice or has ideas but isn't sure how to implement it. I'm happy to talk to anyone. What I would say is follow your dreams and follow your passion and don't give up. The number of people who give up when they're right at the finish line is probably a lot. I have literally been face down on the floor of my office weeping, having lost two projects right before the holidays and came back from that. Um, <laughs> you know, there are moments that have been really tough. It has not been super easy. Um, but I feel so blessed because I feel like this nurtures me, it feeds my soul, it's something that means something to me. Um, I feel that I'm doing good in the world and I really want to keep pushing that. And I think that we're at the precipice of amazing positive change right now. Right now is a complete shit show. It sucks, it's like horrible. Um, and I tell like young people in my audience, this is bullshit and you really need to like, uh, you know, sorry for the curse words, but you realize it's like not fair that we're handing you this mess. So everybody needs to stand up and do what they can to fix things. And I think that that's actually very energizing and very positive. And I think we can do it. We have all the technologies, the techniques, the knowledge, all of the stuff that we need. We just need to put it together and make a plan. And so I would really encourage you, if I can be a, an optimist after studying climate change for as long as I have and going around talking to people about this book, there is something positive in this that can come out of this. And I think that we can also push our profession, like you were saying, Julie, architecture is not irrelevant. Let's not fall into irrelevancy and retreat into the academy and not care. Like, let's use our positions. I mean, let's use our voice to really get out there and engage with our communities. Um, you know, I've been teaching at Penn again, and it's wonderful. The students are wonderful. It's an amazing place still. The ideas are the same. The vibe is the same. Some of the same people are there, like some of your, your old props are still there and they're amazing, you know? And it's an incredibly supportive community that really wants to do good in the world. And that's also really great to see as an alum to go back and to see, you know what? It's different tools, but it's the same place. And I really, really think of that. I'm thoroughly enjoying it. So if anything I said resonates with you, please email me. Well, thank you so much. What an inspiring conversation. And um, I'm going to pass it on to Charlotte. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for attending today's uh, event. And my apologies for my unstable connection from earlier. Just in case, Susan will close with final comments. Um, I want to especially thank Vanessa, Julie, and Susan for their insights. We will share the recording of this and upcoming talks on the Weitzman School site in case you would like to rewatch or share with others. Uh, the Weitzman development team is also planning an additional three virtual talks this fall. On October 19th, join three Weitzman alumni for designing practice. Ruta Bay Pakravan, Kristen Sadell, and Maxine Sags Kennedy will discuss designing practices that engage with the community and the culture of architecture through building. On November 12th, as part of the university homecoming this, this year, please join Preserving Black History Towards a More Inclusive Movement. In this virtual, virtual talk, historic preservation alumna Monica Rhodes, Professor Randall Mason, and architect 
architecture alum, Mark Garner, will discuss preserving the legacy of civil rights history and the creation of a new center at Weitzman School focused on the preservation of civil rights sites. On December 8th, join us for Dialogues with Designers, a conversation between Stuart Weitzman and Wendy Evans Joseph, who will discuss their careers and how, designing, and how designers successfully work with clients. This talk will be moderated by Mark Garner. Keep an eye out, an eye out for announcements to register for this upcoming event. And finally, for Penn alumni and students, QuakerNet, the alumni directory, will soon become my Penn. This dynamic new platform will serve as a one-stop portal with the same benefits of the old system, along with new options for interacting, customizable experience, and updated resources. My Penn will go live in the middle of October. As president of the Alumni Association, I want to thank you all for coming to today's program and extend my gratitude for the ongoing support provided by our alumni community. Stay safe and see you soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.